From Rixie, this is Frameform. Alrighty then, hello everyone and welcome again to another episode of Frameform. It is another day. <laughs> true that, true that. How are you both doing? I'm very excited for today's topic. I feel like I say that every week, but it's true. We sit down at the beginning of the season and we like brainstorm our dreams, what we want to talk about. And this is a topic that I'm super stoked about, especially because we kind of touched on it last year, but now we're going to dive in and we've got another great interview. Thank you for conducting that, Claire. But before we jump into that, let's just talk about what we're watching these days. Well, I started a movie. I haven't finished it yet. I don't do you guys do that? Like start a movie and then like take the night oh, and yeah. then like finish it. Definitely. Some movies I have Maybe to do like that. the day after. <laughs> yeah. Like I'll do it like the day after. And then some cases I'll do it like a week later because it's still kind of fresh. Um so I gotta I guess I gotta do that <laughs> <laughs> as I'm talking here. It should be I should be, um, I've watched it by now, but, um, I started watching, um, my dinner with Andre. Oh, have you guys seen I that? I have not seen it yet. How is it? Okay. It's, uh, HBO, it's on HBO max. If anybody's interested, it's a 1981, like comedy film, but it, it doesn't really seem that way. Maybe the the conversations that they're having here but mm -hmm. it stars Wallace Shawn and Andre G Gregory and if everyone should know who Wallace Shawn is oh, yeah. he's been in thousands of movies um he is known as inconceivable, inconceivable. And, I think that's... and um oh what's his name in Clueless it's Miss Geist and then uh oh um I'm totally I'm it right now I'm totally bugging on that name <laughs> But, any, but anyway, so that it's 1981, early, early 80s, um, New York City, and it's two people having dinner in this like really like bourgeois kind of restaurant. Mm -hmm. And they're just like these two guys that work in theater that haven't seen each other in a long time and they're catching up. And this it's mostly Andre Gregory who's talking in this film. So far, I'm like about like it's a two hour movie. I'm probably like hour and some change in. And man, the stories that this guy talks about, I swear, I think this is how um, the movie Midsummer came about oh. because <laughs> some of the stories that he's talking about, they have such similar like descriptions to what midsummer is mm -hmm. and it's so like it's so strange because midsummer is so scary like it's so like horrific and crazy and demented all at once mm -hmm. and listening to andre gregory like talk in a similar fashion on his experiences of like travel and doing rituals and whatnot i it it's like you're like, wow, okay. Like, this is suspicious, Mr. Hall. <laughs> yeah, this, this is really weird. So um, we'll see. I'll, uh, I'll come back maybe next week and talk about how it ends. But uh, so far, um, if you like a rambling kind of movie, <laughs> mm -hmm. go for it. Watch this movie. Yep. And want to see nothing else but a restaurant for two hours? <laughs> That's your movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm one of those people um, that every time a month is nearing an end, um, I'm trying to binge all the movies that expire, either like from Netflix or like Hulu or um, especially Criterion, um, because um, those are the movies that you really can't find anywhere else. So yeah. I'm kind yeah. of in my in my binge mode of a lot of Jean-Luc Godard stuff. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. yeah. I used to be obsessed. Like it was embarrassing like embarrassingly obsessed. Yeah, so I'm just uh just finished Pierrot Le Faux, Um and So that one's my favorite. Oh yeah. <laughs> my favorite thing about that movie is just all the color coordination mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um you know just that like little silly scene in the middle. So <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's very over the top and that's that one 
is that one's my favorite for that reason. And I think those movies are so important to watch understanding some of the context too, because an audience member now could look at it and see that it's like cheeky and cute and get that there's a bit of a quirk to it, but to understand that they were really changing the way that cinema was done and that this really was so experimental at the time, I think is super important. But yeah, I definitely went through a major French New Wave phase. And I actually remember writing to my school and asking, like, why is there no class specifically on this? And then the oh, next wow. semester, they actually did offer the class. And it was so mm, cool. Awesome. We did new waves from all over the world. So we looked at, like, <gasps> Korean New Wave and French New Wave, oh. like, did a whole tour. And yeah. unfortunately, this professor died in the course of the year. <gasps> and he was, oh, like, no. literally one of my favorite professors. Rest in peace, Mark Harris. And... Yeah, I mean, but the the time that he was teaching the class was amazing. He just had such encyclopedic knowledge and could make these, like, crazy connections. And especially for someone, like, coming out of high school, um, you know, a very traditional high school, to, like, have someone that's just so weird and knowledgeable and casually just being a brilliant person, talking about all this art stuff, was just really awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But something I rewatched recently was Riding in Cars of Boys. Have you all seen that movie? I haven't. It, that's with Drew Barrymore? It is. Mm -hmm. And my family watched it a lot when I was growing up, like almost to the point of exhaustion. That was like one of our go-tos. And I kind of had a hazy memory of it. And I remember there being a lot of like phases of life stuff. So I thought, you know what? I'm I'm going to rewatch it at this phase of my life. And it's actually, I really recommend it. It's so good. I think the one thing <clears throat> I choked there, it's so good. Like the one thing that's weird is at the beginning of the movie or near the beginning, she and Steve Zahn are playing their characters and they're supposed to be like 15 and you have to keep reminding yourself like, okay, they're 15, they're 15. So that suspension yeah. of disbelief is challenging, but like yep. that and the holes in like the side plot with the sun aside it's an excellent movie and it covers a lot of American history. It covers a lot of phases of life and life choices and just has a lot of really good, like wise one liners in there that as an adult person watching it, I was like, wow, my parents are so cool that they played this as much <laughs> as they did when I was growing up. Cause they were really trying to like teach me by showing me. And I know it's just a movie, but it is based on a real story and I do really recommend it. And I actually think it's relevant to what we're talking about today, too, because it does deal with issues of, like, adulthood and maturity, taking on responsibility, but also what does it mean to be a kid and, you know, in some ways, like, who gets to be a kid. Exactly. But before we get into that heavy stuff, what are some movies, you know, today's topic is working with kids. What are some movies that, you know, either you watched when you were younger or you watch now that feature kid casts whether you know a lead or an ensemble cast that you just like absolutely love and let's just like round ramble off a few of those favorites that we've got <laughs> I I love coming to age movies like that's my my thing that I'm also trying to let go of as I'm entering my 30s oh, you don't like, have to no I know but still it's just like it's it's kind of starting to get to a point where you identify so much with a character at a certain age that it starts to cringe a little bit and not in a good way. Like mm. it, it's so that's where I'm starting to feel a little strange. But <laughs> on this list that you created, Jen, Matilda, that was my favorite oh, yeah. as a kid. I identified so much with that as well as Harriet the Spy. Yes. yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't know why that's not typed on here. I had um, the yellow, like, rain jacket, and later in my life, I was actually gifted um, theater binoculars that I still have, and um, I I always think of Harriet the Spy with those binoculars, and yeah, that was a really, that cast in general, I want a garden like that, and that, like. That <laughs> so we met in our 20s, Hannah, but we so would have been friends. I was obsessed with Harriet the Spy. I'm actually like mm, really so disappointed good. in myself. I did not include that in my list because this was like a top of my head type list. This was not like, oh, let me Google movies with uh, kids in them. I was just like, what are some of my dearest movie memories? Here we go. What about you, Claire? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, 
this might be cut from the episode. <laughs> but um, honestly, okay. Honestly, and this is mostly because of, uh, again, a Criterion binge watch as well as a conversation I've had recently with a few friends. One, um, and this actually goes in relation with a, um, a video essay that I saw, Battle Royale. Ah. I mean, I watched that I mean, when I was a teenager, so it was a, a very strange world, but also it, it almost seemed like the, the trials and tribulations of, you know, adolescence taken up to a 10 plus. Yeah. But you know what? We need those movies too. Cause one I left off this list was 13 and that's another oh, yeah. coming of age movie. That's like definitely more <sighs> rough. I haven't, I still haven't seen kids. Uh, I still, oh, kids. I still haven't seen kids was my high school. Jam. <laughs> I still haven't seen <laughs> forever. Harmony cuties, Corinne. You know, so like there are those movies that deal with childhood and matters that involve children that in some cases are helping us process some really challenging life stuff and that don't yeah. sugarcoat, you know, and don't put a, a, a lens on childhood as if like, Oh, it's always perfect for everybody, you yeah. know? Right. Right. And they don't always do that in the fashion of being the Goonies. Oh, totally. Totally. Oh my gosh. I, I love the Goonies. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually have never seen the Goonies. Oh, um, it's just one of those that didn't, didn't get through. I'm going to be honest with you. There's some movies that I, you know, for me, this, you know, back to the futures in this category, you need to see it at a young enough age to get really invested. Like I saw back to the future as an adult and was like, oh, this is great to teach people like, and you know, Michael J. Fox is from 45 minutes from my house. So like Canadian pride here, (laughs) but you know, I was like, this is a great movie to teach kids or, you know, new audiences cause and effect and to expose them to phases of history and stereotypes. But I can't get invested in Christopher Lloyd's like overacting, like, oh, the time machine. Like, I, it's just so <laughs> much. And he'll always be Uncle Fester to me. So I think like some movies you got to see when you're younger in order to get that emotional attachment. But I would still recommend you see The Goonies because you could still find it pretty funny as an adult. I think that's like also one of those movies that like if you had siblings, you would watch it. Oh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I forgot you and my husband I, are both I, only children. Only, only, I'll yeah. be your so sibling. I, I grew up, I grew up watching a lot of rom coms that my mom would watch, <laughs> and then Star Wars that my dad was into. So, a mix. As we move forward, talking about kids today, Claire reached out to filmmaker of the film New London Calling, which takes place in New London, Connecticut, created by Ala Kovgan. In this interview, Claire will be discussing. The making of this film, working with children, and it's definitely going to touch on a lot of topics that we're going to discuss later in this roundtable. So here's that interview. Ala Kovkin, welcome to Frameform. Thank you. Nice to be here. Can you briefly describe your background in dance film and how you got into it in the first place? It's a great question because I think I landed there by chance. I was born in Moscow and I came to America in 1996 uh, specifically because I was very much interested in switching uh, my life from being a linguist and uh, dealing with languages to cinema. The language that attracted me the most probably at the time was the, you know, the images. Um, And so I arrived to America and I ended up at University of Massachusetts. And the first book I think I picked up in the library had to do with um, avant-garde cinema. And the woman I came across was Maya Deren, who we think is a kind of mother of um, dance film in this country, primarily because she articulated what film does for dance and dance for film. So that kind of began the journey because I was from, she was actually my slight compatriot she was from Ukraine and so she was studying with Catherine Dunham uh, the American African-American choreographer so anyway that that story really struck me so I got interested in what she had to do with dance and film but also I started realizing that I had a really hard time writing scripts in English I was very fluent in English but I felt almost like handicapped you know that I couldn't I couldn't express myself through creative writing. So I 
decided that I will start working with physical performers. And I wasn't necessarily limiting to just, uh, to only dancers and choreographers. I was thinking about in a broad sense, um, you know, I was interested in circus people and parkour people and, uh, you know, children playing and anybody really who could express uh, their ideas through uh, action. And then I sort of, you know, the Russians, they have this kind of encyclopedic approach to everything. Like you have to get to know everything that happened between dance and film. So I dived into that. So uh, I, then I discovered that, of course, that cinema, and I never thought about it before, but I realized that cinema and modern dance appeared at the same time in the late 19th century. And of course, cinema was born to capture motion. And so people who made cinema popular were physical comedians. We all know their names around the world. You don't have to go anywhere. Everybody knows that, you know, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, and Lauren Hardy and all those people. And then I started realizing, okay, well, there's just such an organic connection why there's so few good dance films. You know, what, what happened then? So that was the kind of process um, that I went through. I started a festival in St. Petersburg called Kino Dance just to bring, uh, to get to know everything that was made, you know, and also share it with my compatriots. You've had a very busy couple of years recently, um, especially with the premiere of the, I mean, stunning Cunningham um, after a very, what I understand was a very long process, like something like seven years of a process. Can you describe your feelings on having a film come to fruition after such a long process and have it see you see it have a life both in a cinematic setting and online during the lockdowns yeah i mean it's 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 a big project it's bigger than i've ever done i guess i like to make new things every time i can never repeat myself that's i guess something i'm uh, sort of trying to do so uh, this is a 3d film it was conceived as a cinematic experience about legendary American choreographer Mars Cunningham. So of course it wanted, I wanted it um, in on big screen, you know, it was made for cinema. So of course for me, the fact that the lockdown happened um, was heartbreaking in many ways, but you know, the film uh, was acquired in 35 countries and it was supposed to be in, on big screen in those countries. So everybody, every distributor that got it really hoped to release it in 3D at least once we go one step at a time i think this movie would live by itself without me now uh and um you know i hear about so many screenings everywhere but you know it just has its own path honestly even though they the two films like are seemingly different there are so many ideas of merce that do find its way into new london calling or so much of the ethos of merce that do find its way into new london calling so actually, let's go back in time a little bit there. So the film itself was completed in 2010, but it's still even as of a few years ago. And I understand the film itself came as a product of a residency at Connecticut College in New London, Connecticut. Did you know that you wanted to create this kind of film or create the film with children going in? Or like what kind of sparked that idea? The thing about it is it was like with everything, you know, you... I mean, there are different kinds of films. There are films that you plan, that you have to, you know, fundraise for years, that you have to convince the world you have to make it. And then sometimes there are just those kind of amazing, amazing uh, incidents that happen. Um, I think there's a fantastic gentleman, um, a visionary man, I would say, in Connecticut College. His name is Robert Richter. And he is a programming, um, all their dance programming and theater programming um, so uh, Robert invited a com um, the company called Kino Dance Company that I have with uh, that I had with two choreographers, Alyssa Cardone and Ingrid Schatz, and the set designer Dallas Wainwright. The idea was to create interdisciplinary collaborations or expanded cinema installations or you know sort of performances uh, with cinema in it, uh, live performances. So there was like this. Uh, our goal was to really integrate and cross-pollinate different media, you know, because we all came from different artistic disciplines. We didn't have a director. We worked collaboratively. Um, 
Robert invited us to a residency. We had this kind of New England tour. And part of Robert's uh, obligations to the community was to do something with within the community. And, you know, there's always oftentimes that you go to those residencies and there's like, OK, there's a community component. People teach class, people do things and, you know, there's all kinds of things. And he said, you know, he has this dual language arts academy uh, and the teachers are very great. And, you know, maybe we can do something with children. And I always want to do something with children because I think um, actually it goes back to Maya Darren and also this other person, Helen Levitt. She was a photographer in New York and she mostly she photographed Harlem a lot. And her photographs of kids are just unbelievable. You know, she was very interested in children's games. I had that in the back of my mind. And then I decided, Rob, maybe we can try make a movie with them. So uh, that's how it sort of began. We met with um, with the with the school, and the first thing we did was we did a talent show, you know, with kids. Because oh. you know, kids, you just have to create a context for them, and they would, you know, and if they trust you, they would do whatever. Because they are not self conscious. That that's the best thing about kids. They forget that they are actually performing or doing anything. If they are into it, they're into it, and they don't know, you know that you're there right so we did a talent show and i'll never forget this one girl mariah who showed up she was very very uh you know organized and she came with a flute and she opened the flute and she played two notes and then she closed the flute and she walked away and i was like mariah is that it and she's like yes that's my flute so everybody had something to offer you know, and we first we played games with them, so they were quite relaxed in a sense too. So that's kind of I started building it from that, from that, and start thinking about um, what can we do. Now we had about I think four or five sort of day residencies with them prior to us coming to a big residency. I think the film overall really has such a strong sense of communication through physical action, which is really at the core of you know, the intersection of dance and cinema. And can you describe how you landed with the specific activities that we see in the film, like the moments of patty cake and like the whispering at the beginning, jumping rope, or that one moment when the, the kids, I mean, I could, I could list moment by moment by moment, but can you um, describe how you landed on these specific activities or these specific games to, to focus on? Right. So we, first we decided that Okay, this is going to be sort of kind of like a postcard, children postcard to New London, you know. And what I did, I went to the New London Historical Society, uh, being, you know, a researcher at heart. And I looked at a lot of postcards and photographs and all kinds of things that happened in New London. New London is a very interesting town. You know, it has a, a big history, actually. And uh, I, I brought all these postcards. I, I took pictures of them and I brought it to the kids. And I, we started looking at them and I, I, st I started telling them stories. This is what happened here and this is what happened here. And they were very surprised, you know, like there was this kind of moment of like, oh, we live on this history, right? This is kind of uh, interesting, right? So that actually, that, that's one thing we did there. So there's locations, you know, where we're going to do what. So I sort of wanted to get them interested in their own town. You know, so that was one thing. Then we started asking them, can they show us the games they play? And they say, we don't play games. And I said, okay, well, we don't play. Well, okay, well, but you do something during your recess, right? Like, let's let's see what you do. And it's like, well, we maybe, you know, play ball. We do this and we do that. It's like, okay, well, let's just do that. So our choreographers, they started playing what they wanted to play, you know? So it was a kind of not coming from us. It was coming from them, you know? And then we start realizing, and then through that process, every time we came, we would like ask them more. We would do the game they already did and show us, you know, and then we'd ask for more. And then things start to come out. Oh, we do this thing. We do this thing with our hands. Can you show me? And the two girls would get up and they would just do it very fast and, and with the speed of light. And then I would say, well, okay, but can, I, can, can we all do that? You know, can we just, can we sp split in pairs and do that? When you work with children, you have to be a good observer, right? You have to wait. You have to be patient. And that's why, like, it's nice if you have time with them. 
because they don't they don't go they don't do things on call you know it's a you gotta just wait and see what comes out of them and so they so this game for instance with the um with the clapping you know that you know then we managed to choreograph it right so we took what they do and then we managed to arrange them we say okay we're gonna sit together very close to each other and you're gonna all do it you know when i say go you know and we're gonna do it for like 10 times right and as they do that they start forgetting i mean that's the thing right they start forgetting and because they know eventually they're gonna be on camera they are doing it they're doing it for real and then they have fun you know they start enjoying things right they don't stop you know which is what adults do the other thing what we did i said asking like do you know duck duck the goose oh no that's for the five-year-olds we don't <laughs> we don't do that yeah but i mean imagine if we have uh, a huge group doing that so you have to like sprint you know like so it's a real game like it's not for five-year-olds five-year-olds would never do that this is too <laughs> difficult you know so I would sometimes take the games that they think for five-year-olds and would try to push it, you know, like to, to basically make it interesting for them. So that came from us. But also, I would never forget this one incident. I, because I did so much research on children ga children's games, I found these pictures of Japanese kids doing duck duck goose in the interim concentration camp in the United States in 1945. Mm -hmm. And I brought that picture to them. And I said, do you know what that is? And they said, oh, it's Duck, Duck, Goose. I said, okay, it's a black and white picture from 1945. And that, all of a sudden, like, I remember that moment very clearly shifted their understanding of those games. They started realizing that they carry knowledge that people, their, their ancestors might have carried. And also, not only here, but in so many different parts of the world. So when you say you don't know, you don't play any games, that's actually not true. You know, you know so many things. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna share that. And I think that's when I, I think we had a complete trust from that moment on. At what point was the camera brought into the process and did you have to do anything to acclimate the students to the presence of the camera? Yeah, we talked a lot about it, uh, but of course they didn't see this huge camera. The camera was huge, actually. We, it's the first time people were shooting 2K at the time, 2010. Oh. You know, I think it's the first camera to shot 2K. And so it was big camera and there was professional crew, right? So I said, we're gonna shoot every day. We're gonna show up at eight o'clock and we're gonna end at three or four. And then, you know, you're going to have lunch, we're going to do this and that. It's going to be, uh, we have, we're dependent on the sun, right? Mm -hmm. The weather is key. So we're going to learn about the sun. And it's funny because by the end, they knew what the sun is for. It was very interesting. That, that was the big revelation. But they did see some little cameras around because we filmed a little bit. We also filmed with ourselves, with Alyssa and Ingrid, because we had to, we didn't have time with enough time with them to look for shots. Alyssa and Ingrid, we could just them doing it, and we would know which shots to get. So we actually storyboarded it okay. with ourselves doing the games. You know, so we knew the shots we want, um, while basically practicing their games ourselves in the locations that we had to be. When they they got there, we knew exactly the plan was very, very clear. It was very, very organized. One thing what I learned working with dancers is that, you know, dancers, unlike actors, they don't like to wait because once they're mm -hmm. warm, they need to go. Right. They can't because if they're going to wait, then you have to they have to warm up again. So the same with kids. Kids have short attention span. They don't like to sit around. I mean, it built they build stamina. I must say they build over over that week we were working. They got stronger, and more patient. Also, they they kind of they liked it. You know, they like the fact that there are all these people running around with reflectors and cameras. And actually, we had only one camera, but there were all mm -hmm. these photo cameras. And, you know, there was uh sort of a process and the concentration i think you know that we have to co get concentrated together we're doing this together if one of us is not doing it we can't do it 
right? Yeah, so so they were not intimidated by that time because we already had relationships with them. And again, I do think relationships is key if you want people to collaborate with you, you mm-hmm. know, because otherwise you show up, you film, they do what they can, but then there's no, you can achieve what you need if you, if they just sort of showing up, you know, without prep. I'm a big believer in prep and building relationships. So I think um, the shoot went very smoothly. You know, um, we would always often start with a group and then we kind of let people go as individual kids. We need individual kids. I mean, we try to give kind of solos to every talent we could, everybody who wanted to do it. You know, but there was not, all the, the direction was you come here, we arrange you how, where you are, and then you do what you need to do, you know, but you repeat it so that we can actually get into groove. It's not like one time, let's make it five times, you know, like just keep going. One of the key themes of the film is the disappearance of children's culture. And I feel that that comes through in so many different ways throughout the film where, I mean, not only do you have like the bright shirts juxtaposed against sort of this industrial setting, but there are some moments where, the kids are like playing in alleys or playing. Um, maybe there's one dedicated playground, but there really isn't any space dedicated to them. Um, at what point did this theme start to emerge? And um, did the students themselves offer experiences to corroborate this theme? Yeah, I mean, I felt that this is something I noticed about New London from the first sight, how empty it is. Like you walk around. I mean, this town used to be bustling and now it's like, it's nothing like it's completely like you walk around, maybe you see one person, you know, in the street. So it was a kind of movie set, you know, (laughs) it felt like a movie set that just sort of people left, you know, it's like New York and during the pandemic in April, 2020, like you could ride your bike on fifth Avenue in the middle or, you know, wherever it was, you know, so it's just, it was eerie, you know, and it's in surreal at the same time. And, I just wanted them to activate the spaces, you know, like let's bring life to it. I mean, why is it so dead? You know, like they used to be people here and the kids play and, you know, they used to do all these things. I see the, the photographs, I see the postcards, I see the, all the stuff. Like, you know, why don't we animate it? Why don't we animate this place? And so the kids were very much into it, uh, but also I think for them, they were discovering the, the town, their town again. You know, I mean, they, it's a very diverse socioeconomic um, background they have. You know, they come from different um, backgrounds, some, you know, very wealthy, some, you know, not wealthy at all, you know. And so, so like all of them were discovering the town in a new way, you know, something they never noticed before, you know. And for us, of course, we were looking for cinema. I mean, you know, besides activating, I mean, I do think that, you know, cinema thinks in places and spaces, you know, not in theatrical stages. So it's good with space, you know. So for me, I, for us, and especially with our director of photography, Makomo Hassan, we, we're thinking about where these different games would shine. You know, how can we marry location and the action. So yeah, it was fun. I mean, I, I say like this, this whole movie was such fun to make. I mean, all these other movies I made, you know, they're, they're difficult. You know, there was really mm-hmm. sort of a lot of effort uh, and the years of work and so much pressure all the time. Now this film was real fun. There were moments, you know, I mean, uh, you know, they got tired, it was very hot often, you know, there was all these things, but it's like with anything, you just have to, find a way to, you know, to sort of cheer, cheer all the time, to be a bit of a cheerleader, to to just sort of get the energy going. And once they're in it, they, you know, they don't complain. There's, I had a bit of a connection um, or sort of like a deja vu moment back to when I first watched Cunningham, when I rewatched New London Calling uh, for this episode. And specifically, like there's the sense of melancholy when watching Cunningham knowing that these dancers, this is likely the last generation of dancers who worked with Merce himself. And there's a similar feeling watching New London Calling with this generation of children. And you mentioned earlier how um, sort of unperformative they were in front of the camera. 
now we're dealing with a generation that's so ingrained in social media and so ingrained in devices that performance is a part of your life really from an early age. If you were to approach a project similar to New London Calling today, how do you think it would be different? That's a great question. I mean, I just think kids are kids. Um, and we, and as children, and actually as humans, talking about Merce Cunningham, you know, like, uh, you know, while we're moving, we're alive. <laughs> Once we don't move, we're dead, basically. So, I mean, children are no different. You know, I mean, they're, we are wired to move. We move much less. As, I mean, of course, we're in the dance world, people move. But, like, overall, because of this sedentary kind of way of life, in the Western society, I think it's really important to differentiate. Here, it's all very regimented. You know, there's no freedom, in a sense. You know, we live in New York. My kid mm -hmm. is 10 years old. Can he go outside by himself, meet his friends and just wander around streets and, you know, ride, do parkour or skateboard or whatever it is? The answer is probably no, you know, like, because even if you let him, the other people would say, why is he walking around at 10 years old alone? You know, what's going on? So there is that kind of it's not so much about the gadgets, right? It's a, it's about the attitude we have as parents, mostly to. Um, to the so-called safety, right? Mm -hmm. And what's going on in, especially in the urban cities where people live together so close. So that's where naturally children would play together outside in the street. I mean, in New York, in New York City, streets used to be closed in the afternoon for children to, you know, roam around. And there's a big movement actually even right now to try to restore that because they don't have space, you know, to other than playgrounds and they need supervision all the time. So to me, this is a much bigger problem than the gadgets because gadgets are everywhere. And whether it's in, you know, in Brazil or Zimbabwe or India or, you know, anywhere they're there, but it doesn't mean that all that physicality is going, you know, yes, they spend more time on those things, but, it, but they also get more exposure. So I'm not, I am not so concerned. I would still push for the games they know. Sh let them show what they know. Let them show off. Everyone wants to show off. And also you're going to see people who don't want to do that. And then the question is like, what do you do with them? Because idea of participation and finding something unique for every kid, that was pretty much my goal in a sense. It's something that would sort of highlight them. So it is a somewhat democracy. It's not a meritocracy like, oh, I can play violin like virtual, so I can play you know, everybody, even if you can just, you know, I don't know, play two notes on flute and close it down. I love that. You know, that's great. You know, let's all be together. Let's find a way to express, you know, because every single person and especially child, I mean, they have so much creativity. Absolutely. That's a beautiful thought to end on. Ala, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Claire and Allah. That was such a great idea to bring her on. You know, we love something that we're doing more in season two is we're bringing in more voices. We're bringing in more people for interviews and it's a lot more coordination, but I think it's definitely worth it to really highlight more perspectives in this field, especially with something that's a niche, like working with kids. Before we get into anything else with this film or this topic, I definitely want to shout out the documentary film, Let's Get the Rhythm, directed by Irene Chagall. Um, yes. This is a film I actually first saw at San Francisco Dance Film Festival, where, you know, listeners know that Claire is their production assistant and, like, works with them and has for many years. And I also screened it at my inaugural festival, Cascadia Dance and Cinema Festival. And it's a film all about clapping games and, you know, rhythmic games and the rhymes that go with it and just the legacy and the history and just so many cool things about that specific I hesitate to even just call it like a genre of movement like but that like mm -hmm. subculture and that legacy and that oral slash physical tradition so anyways that will be linked in the show notes but Hannah and Claire what were your impressions of New London Calling I know that I was a huge fan but I'm interested in what stood out to the both of you about this film 
Yeah, so I mean, I've seen this film screened at several different places in several different contexts. And I think the most recent screening, which actually was two years ago, so I mean, almost a decade after the film was made, was in a children's program. And it stood out in many regards in that area in that it was a longer film. It was less of a narrative film, but well, the audience was engaged and it really uh, was different from the rest of the programming that felt like it was coddling and like very much sort of lowest common denominator of what we think children's films are. And I really appreciate that the film really goes the extra mile as far as really showing the the physicality of the children as the the connecting force throughout as like as the main connector throughout the film. Well, even from the opening shot you see that, you know, they're playing telephone and their movement is inviting the camera to move. It's very naturally incorporated in, you know, even though there's no story, there's still like a, a narrative, there's a path to follow, there's some logic to things. I feel like it's not You know, there's like vignettes of uh, children playing games. And I think that it has enough variety. And the things that Allah highlighted in the interview, like working with the, the cast and trying to find their natural movement, their natural habits and inviting that authenticity out of them. I think a lot of those things just would work for any performer of any age and people that do a good job working with kids or with any special audience add these extra considerations yet I find they could work with any group of people because really they're just different lenses with which we can be more mindful. Yeah. I really thought this film, they were talking about like how this information of working with kids can transfer to anything. And it just make me, makes me think of like the first thing that Ala talks about is how she used to be a linguist. So thinking about how, to be like universal and that was what I was thinking about especially when she's talking about like when she was researching like children's games and looking at the photographs and they're like oh like this is is this your mom and it's like (laughs) no these is like these are kids (laughs) in another country in 1945 and I just thought about like how being a child can be so universal and understanding because everyone has been in that position, even kids, you know, as the age that they are at this very moment and how it's easy to just like understand one another and habits and energy and emotion. You know, it's just, it's such a broad scope of just existing. Absolutely. And it really says a lot that she has such trust in the the cast and really brings out the trust in, really has them bring out the trust in themselves, like trusting the, you know, the knowledge that they, they carry forward. And there's something refreshing about seeing this group on screen and seeing a group so uninhibited playing, moving on screen that and sometimes when you see certain dance films or certain moments when kids are clearly choreographed, then that doesn't really show. Like you can see like at the back of the mind, like someone's telling them to do something. And there really is, yeah, as all I mentioned, like this organic quality of play. And I think through the editing and through, I guess, the repetition that she said, the film really does show this play as an essential ritual of childhood. Yeah. Well, part of what makes this film just such a breath of fresh air is that it it does have that authentic feel to it the fact that kids are just doing these you know pedestrian things and they seem to know each other they have like a good chemistry you don't get that as soon as you have sometimes as soon as you have trained dancers because you know someone that is you know particularly if you're looking at projects that involve children and kids sometimes these are you know just average kids that are not trained performers. Sometimes they have some training and sometimes these are legit working professionals. And Mm -hmm. 
there's just, a, it depends on the goals of the project. And, you know, you look at someone like Macaulay Culkin, who was a performer from a very young age, like trained in dance, did all of the, you know, the Balanchine's Nutcracker, did Home Alone. Like, this is someone that acted like a quote unquote real kid, but very clearly did not have a quote unquote real childhood. And I think a great thing about these short form films that we're seeing in festivals made with quote unquote real kids is that we do get to capture some of that natural essence that is not incredibly performative. But at the Mm -hmm. same time, Claire, you brought up this point that where technology is now, kids sort of live in a somewhat performative mindset. And I do think that we're kind of past a point of no return where it's a form of innocence to be uninhibited and not be embarrassed and like be able to be silly without thinking my friend's going to get a video of this on their phone and post it. You know, so my heart kind of breaks for that. With that all said about just like the consciousness of being innocent versus like consciously being aware of your surroundings and all of that, like I think in the end, like in this film in particular, it's just kids being kids and doing everything you know the energy of it like I just I wrote like a whole bunch I wrote a bunch of adjectives just like innocent vibrant young uh energetic unstoppable what I think is so also very like natural about New London Calling in particular is yet there is some choreography but yet I feel like the choreography is more shown in the edit so with all that said it's just like you know capturing what is being captured in that time and then turning it into something and this film totally succeeds at that just because of like if you're a bystander just sitting at a playground or even by a bunch of kids playing you can see that rhythm and pattern of how children play and that definitely shows through in the edit that all has created in this world yeah and really a world created by the kids on screen like that vibrance and that even just in the production design itself the bright colors against the kind of dreary town around them is really impressive the 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 tone is uh kept pretty high throughout the film and another reason i really love this film is that it really does touch on the idea that children's culture is disappearing from the streets. And usually like if they're, I mean, being in the Bay area, this is a constant issue where like if there are people building developments, like oftentimes like a children's playground is going to be the one thing to go and how so much of what was a crucial part of children's culture, like the playgrounds, like, like play areas are slowly being siphoned off and people are and their attention is slowly siphoned to the screen. Yeah, it's interesting with um, our youth company, my husband Mark and I, um, the Jam Youth Project, we make dance films as part of what we do with this training company, and it's a tap dance company. And over the years, you know, we've screened at different festivals, and it's been really interesting to hear audience um, reception of these films because people are so happy to see kids happy on screen What we really wanted to do were show different stories and settings that let kids be kids and that highlighted childhood. And the really messed up thing is, you know, so the the three films uh, that are linked in the show notes are in chronological order are Farther Up the Road, If I Ruled the World, and Recess. And when we did If I Ruled the World, this was shot at different locations in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. And when we were brainstorming, we just wanted to show different scenes from childhood, like making s'mores, like running around with the dog, you know, uh, running outside with your sleeves dangling, Gabriella, in the last shot. So, you know, (laughs) watch it at the last shot. This girl's, like, sleeves are, like, four inches too long, and they're flopping around in slow motion. It was, as an editor, I was like, no! But then I thought, oh, wait, it's kind of perfect. But anyways, the funny thing about that day was... There were no no phones and the kids actually got to bond with each other and hang out. And multiple times they were saying, I feel like a kid again. And I'm thinking, this is so messed up. You're 14. Like, 
Yeah. Like, get off your phone more often if that's how you feel today. Audiences really liked it. And a question that we got more than once was, oh, how, what's it like? Do you feel really limited trying to tell stories with children? And one of the things I thought was, if it's so hard to tell a story with children and to choreograph for children, then what are you doing with adults? Because I find that sometimes in dance, people just go for like the sex appeal or the romance. And that's really like an easy out. And as soon as you're removing that and you're saying, okay, let's just look at people here and and take out that easy plot point, you know, then you got to get a little more creative and then you actually stand out without that much effort sometimes. Absolutely. And something I really love about If I Ruled the World, I mean, I I love so much about it. Well done, Jen and uh, Mark and Jam Youth uh, Project. But yeah, the genuine camaraderie that we see on the screen, not just in these little vignettes, but also in the performance itself. And I mean, it's, I mean, the, the movement is performed extremely well, but there really is a sense of like, I, I don't want to say elbowing each other, but there really is a sense of dancing with, with the group that it, this isn't just like a sense of like a bunch of sporadic soloists that everyone is moving together. And this really is a, um, a communal activity. Yeah. And with that, it definitely gives us thing of like freedom and I feel like being a kid is kind of like having freedom I know I it, even though all of us have freedom but you know like as you get older you get more tied into different things and you are focusing on specific projects or ideas or practices but you know one thing I was working on a project a while back and he was the interviewer or interviewee was talking about just kids in general and how, you know, when they're so young, they have, they're like a spotlight that's so big and it's so wide. And you definitely feel that in this narrative in particular, especially just like the, just as they're performing, as they're, running through the leaves and throwing a football and whatnot like that's what being a kid is all about you have the whole world in front of you and it's that's really funny that someone in the audience was asking like how is it hard to create stories and like they're the most imaginative of you know of filmmaking you can do whatever I mean look at Stranger Things that was part of our list that we were writing um of recent things like Talk about creating a world with so much uh, feeling and imagination and, you know, there's so much there. And I think part of it might be, you know, actual truth, like actual fact that children do bring this out in adults. But I think some of it is just adults being receptive to the opportunity, the invitation. But it can really be so much fun to work with kids like if you are someone that doesn't like children please don't work with them but <laughs> you know I find that when you when you get into a creative space with them it's really interesting and even working with younger kids versus teenagers can be different I- including them in dance film in screen dance this is why I do workshops with kids of all ages you know it invites them to this whole world of opportunities because I think far too often those children that are interested in dance can really get kind of bottlenecked and kind of put on a few tracks. Like I'm going to be a competitive dancer and then I'm going to go to university and I'm going to be on the dance team and then I'm not going to dance again. Or I'm going to go to a conservatory. I'm going to have a professional career or I'm going to go to school for a commercial dance. You know, like there are these different avenues or, you know, highways <laughs> that people right. take into dance careers. And I think at a young age, as children are really forming their opinions and adhering to those dreams and and thinking about what they might want to do in that really open state, it's important for them to see, wow, I could be a costume designer. I could be the person behind the camera. I could be an editor, you know? And I think that creating films that include young people is an invitation for them to watch them and engage as well. Because, you know, when you are a kid, there's so much of the world that feels like it's rigged for adults. You feel like you are in a grown up world. And even like 
cabinets and things are higher up and you have to struggle to reach them. And something that Hannah wrote in our notes for this film, for these films was that framing the framing and the camera angle and the camera level can help you relate more or less to the actual experience of being a child. So I, I love that you put that note in there, Hannah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the biggest and most noticeable way of like, these examples of like being in that kid frame set because they're just like you know kids are always looked down upon I mean and this is the same way in movies that are just this center point of around kids like you are put in their shoes you are standing at their height you know and I think that's what helps us as even older audiences you know, relate to them more or go back to that, what all was saying, where it's like, there's this universal input into like feeling like a kid, you know, everyone's been in that position, no matter what age you are, including the age you are as a child. Yeah. And something that I really appreciate both from Allah's film and uh, as well as uh, the Jam Youth films as well is just really prioritizing kids in the present. And it really ties back to what you were saying, Jen, that there's this sort of like one track mind as far as, you know, a a child or someone who's growing up training is only projecting a really the adult version of themselves or really working toward the adult version of themselves. And as a result, oftentimes in training, there can be this hierarchical relationship. And sometimes that can find its way into films as well. And that the child devalues their experience, devalues their their perspective in favor of someone who is, you know, the grown up, the one who has you know, who has that experience. And obviously, there's a lot of room for bad faith ways that play that plays out. But really, the importance of engaging younger students and younger dancers in this experience of creating and sharing their story is really sharing, like that they're their experience is is valued and really prioritizing that and really really having the chance to to live in that too. And I think because we don't see as many examples of dance films with children as we do dance with children because the uh, dance studio industry is massive globally but you know in the United States it is a massive industry. You know, so often we kind of take it for granted as just like a kids activity that is done. And unfortunately, we do see adults that are just teaching to teach or not teaching because they really are passionate about working with children at this particular phase of their life. So, you know, at the same time, part of what we've said today is that, you know, working with kids, you can bring the same consideration you would and thoughtfulness you could bring to any person at any age. There are some things that are different. And, you know, as part of the show, we always want to talk about some quick tips and behind the scenes and best practices. So just some quick points that I've got on if you are working with kids to keep in mind are, you know, having contracts and liability waivers. You know, it's not a play date. If you are indeed working with people's (laughs) children, especially for multiple hours and, you know, like, and if I ruled the world, like the one girl's hanging off the side of our Jeep while I'm filming and the other girls on an ATV. So like, these are things that we need a waiver for and we need parental trust. You know, that said, parental and guardian communication transparency, even if a kid is 16 or 17 years old and they seem very mature and, you know, they can pack their own snacks and they remember the choreography, this is still a minor. So, you know, including parents and communication is really important. And then, you know, something that I think all today's films did is think about why you're using children of this and even the word using it's like why are you working with like why are these Mm -hmm. the people advancing the story and not just thinking about it in a one-way relationship like oh how did they contribute to the movie or the film think about the effect it has on them as well because especially when we're dealing with serious topics You know, I've seen a lot of social justice pieces about like gun violence or suicide or like heavy topics. You want to be really careful that you're not traumatizing them. Mm -hmm. You're not working with them on topics before they're ready for it or without their parents knowing about it. Right. So, yeah, those are just some general tips if you are 
thinking about um, working with children or, you know, someone who is, just keep those in mind. And I'm also going to link in the show notes some great resources that are more dance focused, but all pertain to, you know, as the top resource, Youth Protection Advocates and Dance, I'm an advisory panel member for them. So one of our yeah. one of our main <laughs> things is keeping kids happy, healthy, safe, and dance. So if you want to keep kids happy, healthy, safe, and dance, take a look at all the resources linked in the show notes as well. Well, we couldn't say it better than that. Thank you, Jen, so much for providing your experiences and your passion towards helping children in the dance world and dance film world as well. Yes. More studios need more Jen Rays. <laughs> yes. Aw, thank but you. Other than that, thank you, everyone, for listening in, and we will be back in your ear holes next week. A whole week, <laughs> week older next week. <laughs> We have a few announcements today. Head to the Dance Cinema link in the show notes to check out our Not Just for Kids playlist, including the Jam Youth Project films we discussed today and other dance films featuring and curated for the young and the young at heart. Plus, we've got other curated playlists of our festival archives available for free. Want to submit your film? Click on the Film Freeway link instead. And we have Screen Dance International happening in Detroit, Michigan from September 9th through 12th at the Detroit Institute of Arts in collaboration with Detroit Dance City Festival and Arts Lab J. This will be happening in person. Hope you can make it. Do you love what you're hearing? Do you want to be heard? Send us an email at frameformpodcast at gmail.com and engage with us on social at frameformpod. That's frameform, P-O-D. If you really love what you're hearing, leave us a review and rate the show. It makes it easier for more listeners to find it. If you want to spread the love, tell your friends to subscribe and keep the conversation going. Thanks for listening. Frameform is a production of Rixie, hosted by Hannah Weber, Jen Ray, and Claire Schweitzer. Edited by the Frameform team. Mix and theme song by myself, Mason Carlton. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.